melanoma. Our next speaker uh, is Dr. Basil Shapelis. Dr. Shapelis is associate professor uh, in my department at USF. Uh, he is also chief of our d of dermatologic surgery and associate pro residency program director. And uh, he's a fine mo surgeon, and he's going to talk to you tonight about non-melanoma skin cancer. What's new in diagnosis and management? Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you, Dr. Fenske. Thank you, Dr. Robbins and Dr. Spencer for inviting me. If we could have the uh, first question up, please. So the first question is, what is the proper treatment for a poorly differentiated squamous cell of the upper mucosal lip with a Breslau depth of six millimeters in a healthy 45-year-old male? Great. Good. So I thought I'd start off with an easy one, just kind of whet your appetite a little bit. And uh, we can go into the regular slides now for the talk. So I have no conflicts of interest to report. And the topics that I'm going to be talking about today is first, I'm going to give you a brief legislative update on tanning beds. Next, we're going to discuss uh, some of the new treatments for basal cell carcinoma. And then I'm going to talk about some of the changes in the staging system for squamous cell carcinoma. So nearly 30 million uh, people in the United States tan in tanning salons every year. And more than 70% of them are females between the age of 16 and 49. And we know that the younger you are when you start indoor tanning, the greater your risk to develop melanoma. Tanning beds typically give off about three times the UVA rays that are emitted by the sun. And tanning to these UVA rays produces the same long-term damage as a sunburn which increases your risk for skin cancer and premature skin aging. Interestingly, tanning bed, these are some amazing statistics, tanning bed in use increases your risk of melanoma by 75% if you're exposed to tanning beds before the age of 35. And the risk of melanoma increases by a whopping 800% for those using tanning beds more than 10 times a year. So contrary to what the tanning industry wants us to believe, there really is no safe tan. And I think the AAD and our state and local societies have really done a fantastic job getting this message out. And that has resulted um, in, our, in our legislators starting to listen. And uh, this year it goes into effect, California has passed a law that bans tending bed use for teens uh, less than 18 years old. And Texas has also passed a law that bans the use of tanning beds for uh, children 16 or less. And there are 30 other states that have laws restricting the use of tanning beds. Here in Florida, you can't use a tanning bed unless you have signed consent um, from your parent. So hopefully as we're able to spread this message out, hopefully it'll end the myth of the healthy tan. And if this photo doesn't, do, doesn't convince you of the long-term damage of UVA rays, I don't know what else what will. And I think the little guy there sticking out his tongue agrees with me. But nevertheless, human nature being what it is, people are probably gonna continue to, to tan and that's why non-melanoma skin cancer is the most common type of cancer in the United States, with more than one million cases each year. Um, as we know, it's usually seen in the middle-aged and elderly. And basal cell is more common than squamous cell carcinoma, except in organ transplant patients, where that ratio is reversed. Um, organ transplant patients have a tenfold greater risk of basal cell carcinoma and a 65-fold greater risk of squamous cell. And that's just important information just to keep it back in your mind when we get a little bit later on into talk when we talk about squamous cell carcinoma. As you know, um, basal cell generally has a slow progressive course. It tends to enlarge over months to years, and it rarely metastasizes. But it is capable of extensive tissue destruction. And if it's untreated, it can be very destructive, as in this patient. And up until recently, we really haven't had anything really good to offer these patients. But that's beginning to change as research progresses. We're beginning to understand the different molecular abnormalities that lead to the development of basal cell carcinoma. One of those is the upregulation of the hedgehog signaling pathway, where either a loss of the tumor suppressor gene patch or the persistent activation of the receptor smoothing can um, lead to increased proliferation and development of basal cell carcinoma. Now, this pathway is normally inactive in adult tissue, but through mutations, it can become active. So if we look at that a little bit more closely, here we have our cell membrane and the nucleus. The green uh, here is the smoothing receptor. And 
if the, the smoothen receptor becomes activated, then it initiates a signaling cascade to the nucleus, and then you get replication, eventually basal cell carcinoma. And in normal tissue, the patch protein inactivates smoothen. But if you have a mutation where we lose patch, or we have a mutation that um, keeps uh, smoothen chronically active, or what we call a gain of function, then this signaling cascade is gonna become active all the time and lead to skin cancer. So once we have an understanding of that cascade, it became natural to kind of look for how do we inhibit this cascade once it becomes active. And that has led to the first hedgehog pathway inhibitor, which is uh, vismotigib, which is an antagonist of the smoothen receptor. And this was reported in the Aravans trial, in which they looked at 104 patients, 71 of which had uh, latent, or I'm sorry, which had 71 had locally aggressive basal cell carcinoma, and 33 had metastatic basal cell carcinoma. And each patient received uh, vismotigib 150 milligrams PO. And then the authors reported a 43 response rate in the locally advanced cohort, and a 30% response rate in the metastatic cohort. They, note they reported a uh, progression-free survival of nine and a half months and a clinical benefit in 75% of patients. And what they mean by that is there was a decrease in tumor size or perhaps you had an ulcerating lesion that was able to dry up or prevented the tumor from growing further. The adverse effects were generally well tolerated. Uh, most common were muscle spasms, hair loss, altered taste sensation, weight loss, fatigue, diarrhea. Um, these are some photos from the study. And you can see how the tumors just gradually uh, will uh, shrink in size and dry up. And when we have some of these larger areas, especially like the inferior photo, you can see if you try to excise that, you, pretty much you're going to have to remove you know, the entire mid-face, the upper lip. That's going to be a devastating wound to the patient. And so really now for the first time, we have something that we can offer these patients as palliative treatment um, to help decrease the symptoms and decrease their tumor burden. I'm going to move on to the next component, and I term this the euphoria of euphorbia, because when I first read about euphorbia in the media, there was a lot of hype and buzz, and it made it sound like we could just throw away our scalpels and we'd be able to treat all our basal cells with creams. I had patients coming into the office, and they wanted to, you know, just have a cream to treat, you know, their perineural basal cell, and um, so once I discussed all the limitations of the study, um, the euphoria kind of ebbed away, and some of them became dysphoric, but... Um, and nevertheless, this is an important topic because I think it's going to have some sort of role um, going forward in the future, and we need to know about it. So euphorbia peplis is, a, is also known as milkweed. In the UK, it's known as petty splur spurge. And there's been anecdotal reports of its use in asthma and skin cancer in Veruca. The active ingredient is inginol meditate. And so there was a study uh, reported in the British Journal of uh, Dermatology, and this was the main study that was reported in the media. Uh, it is important to note that it was sponsored by Peplin Biotech, which um, produces the, the product. Um, but it was, they treated 28 lesions of VCC in patients that either refused, failed, or had, or unsuitable for conventional therapy. They were treated with the sap from the plant for three days. The median diameter of the tumor was 1.6 centimeters. 35% were located on the head and neck, 15% on the arms, 21% on the legs, and I'm sorry, 21% on the trunk and 29% on the legs. 82% of the patients had a clinical response rate of one month at one month, and the patients not responding at one month were given a second course. At 15 months, they noted that 50%, 57% of the patients had a response, um, but they didn't perform any excisions of these areas. They only um, performed a punch biopsy. They didn't say what size punch that they used, but as we know, the medium diameter was about 1.6 um, centimeters. So here, if you just take a four millimeter punch, there could be some sampling error there. Um, this is another photo just showing a typical response. Uh, as far as the adverse reactions, they were generally well tolerated. There was some erythema and desquamation, typical of what you would expect um, from the other types of creams that we have to treat, such as 5-FU or amicumod. Um, but interestingly, I think what, that there was no pain in 43%. And if this product comes to market, I think that's one of the advantages that it's going to have. Because as you know, when patients go through 5-FU or Omicromod or some of the other creams, there can be a lot of discomfort associated with that. So I think that's very important to note. Um, it's important not to get in the eyes. There have been some reports of corneal abrasions. 
And there was one other study reported in the Australian literature where they had 60 patients, they treated uh, superficial, uh, superficial basal cell carcinoma, and they evaluated it at three different concentrations. The 0.05% was found to be most effective. They tried two different um, treatment arms. SAT was applied on days one and two for one arm, and then on days one and eight for the other arm, and they found that the application on successive days was more effective. All of the lesions were excised at, uh, on day 85, and they had about a 63% histologic uh, clearance rate, and all of the patients tolerated it well. This is a photo from their uh, study, and just shows a pretty mild uh, reaction, and again, I think that's gonna be one of the advantages, that the reaction is not gonna be as intense and not as uh, painful. But again, right now, you know, it's still in development, further studies are needed, the follow-up has only been very limited. In cancer studies, we like to have five-year follow-up to know our recurrence rates, and so far the recurrence rates that they're porting are even much less than what we have for cryotherapy and electrodesiccation and triotage. Gonna move now into uh, squamous cell carcinoma, and what, about 2,500 people lose their lives each year to cutaneous squamous cell. And we can expect that the incidence of aggressive or advanced squamous cell is gonna be increasing due to the expanse of the older population and as well as the longer survival of organ transplant recipients. Um, organ transplant recipients have higher rates of squamous cell carcinoma and their tumors tend to be more aggressive. Um, so it's gonna be important to accurately record and analyze the prognostic data in order to formulate treatment plans. As you know, the AJCC was established in 1959 to publish uh, systems of classification. And I'm sure as you all know, they stage cancer according to tumor characteristics, lymph node status, and metastasis. And once those are determined, then we can uh, define their overall stage. Now, hospitals are required to record this information. And um, until recently, AJCC included cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma within the entire category of um, non-melanoma skin cancer. And now for the very first time, they've created a separate category just for cutaneous squamous cell. That's separate from all of the other non-melanoma skin cancers. So this is gonna more accurately reflect the natural history and prognostic outcomes. And this is included in the seventh edition of the AJC manual. Now there've been several changes that have, have occurred within the cutaneous squamous cell classification, which is one I wanna go over with you. And this is actually an area that I'm very interested in and have published in um, back even far back as 2002 in Journal of Dermatologic Surgery. And um, I was very pleased to see that the work group kind of referenced our article. And one of the uh, changes in the tumor category is that several studies point to two centimeters as the threshold beyond which tumors are likely to metastasize. And so tumors that are greater than two centimeters, their local recurrence rate is double and the metastatic rate is triple. Now the previous edition also included five centimeters, but as we've gotten more data, that's not really a, a valid breakpoint, and so it's been removed from the seventh edition. The previous edition also did not include um, elements known as high risk factors, but now with the, all the data that we have, the high risk factors have been included into the staging system. And when you combine those high risk factors with diameter, we can now classify tumors as T1 or T2, and I'll go over that with you. Um, one of the high risk factors is depth of tumor invasion. And uh, there's, we note that there's an increasing metastatic rate as invasion progresses. So for adipose tissue, the metastatic rate is 4.1%, and that increases all the way up to 12.5% as it gets down into muscle and bone. So if a uh, squamous cell has a Breslau depth greater than two millimeters or a Clark level four or greater, it's now designated as a high risk feature. Squamous cells located on the ear or lip also have a higher metastatic rate and recurrence rate, so these are also incorporated into the system as high risk factors. Uh, perineural invasion is, an, is a high risk factor as well. If you, this is um, the nerve here in the middle, it's just surrounded by all the squamous cell carcinoma. And you know, if you perform most surgery and you see this, you know that feeling as your heart just sinks because you know your patient's prognosis has just worsened. Poor differentiation also has a higher recurrence and metastatic rate and is included as a high risk factor. So to summarize our high risk factors now are a size greater than two centimeters, a Breslau depth greater than two millimeters, 
Stark level four or greater, perineural invasion, poor differentiation, and strain of cells located on the ear and lip. So the, here we have our uh, tumor staging, and if we just look at um, the T2, that's tumor greater than two centimeters in greatest dimension with or, or without an additional risk feature or any size with greater or equal to two high risk factors. So if you have a one centimeter tumor, but it's poorly differentiated and has a Breslau depth of three, that's now considered a higher, you know, it's gonna put you into the T2. And as we'll see, being in the T2 puts you into stage two. So now this um, system is a lot more accurate because it, it accounts for the worst prognosis that these patients have when they have a higher risk tumor. In the previous edition, it also only classified lymph node status based on the absence or presence of lymph node metastasis. The seventh edition now accounts for the size, number, and location of the lymph node, uh, which is important prognostic information. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all of this, but I'll just read for um, N1, metastasis in a single ipsilateral lymph node less than or equal to three centimeters. So it's incorporating now all of that data as the size, the location, and um, the number of lymph nodes. There hasn't been any change in the metastatic um, portion of the staging system, M0 for no distant metastasis, and M1 present uh, distant metastasis. And so once you have uh, your, P you, once you determine each T, N, and M, then you can uh, see which stage your patient falls into. I think the biggest thing that affects us as dermatologists is being aware of the high risk factors that's now gonna put your patient into uh, a stage two. So again, the main basic changes from the seventh edition to the sixth edition is that size is only, only two centimeters is used as the cutoff. We've gotten rid of the five centimeters. Um, it used to be uh, less than two between two and five and then greater than five. Now it's just two. So less than two or greater than two. Thickness and level of invasion are high risk factors, um, as well as, strain, as uh, location of the ear and lip, poor differentiation, and perineal invasion are also included as high risk factors. Now we'll just go on to a couple of post-test um, questions. If we could have those pulled up, please. So which pathway has been implicated in the development of basal cell carcinoma? A, porcupine, B, hedgehog, C, Hogsmeade, D, NMIC, E, BRAF. I threw C in for your po Harry Potter fans. Mm -hmm. So they have the answer, great, D, Hedgehog. If we could go on to the uh, second question. Which of the following are considered high risk factors for squamous cell carcinoma? A, size greater than two centimeters, B, perineal invasion, C, depth greater than two millimeters, D, A, and B, D, A, B, and C. Any of you have the answers? Can we have the answer slide, please? Results. Well, the answer is E, A, B, and C. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chapellis. All right.